friend of mine, Kathy Compton Lilly, who is um, not, as I said, not a stranger to us at all. Um, but when she left the University of Wisconsin-Madison, she left a major hole here in Wisconsin, and we miss her terribly. She now is at the University of South Carolina, and she is one of the most effective and relentless advocates of teachers and children, not letting politics get in the way of her message nor her research. Her research situates teachers and diverse children as thinkers, knowers, and problem solvers, recognizing their humanity. Kathy and her research are internationally recognized. She speaks at conferences all over the world. And you may not know that recently, I think maybe it was about a year ago, she can clarify this. She served as honorary chair professor at National Singh Wow, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, University in Taiwan. She has been engaged in a longitudinal study, which I know began when she was a first grade teacher, and it's been going on for at least 13 years, that follows immigrant families from primary school through high school. And like I said, I think it's really important to know that she started her career in upstate New York as a first grade teacher. She knows. She has lived our life. Her work is published in many research journals, including the Reading Research Quarterly, Journal of Early Childhood Literacy, Reading Teacher, and Journal of Literacy Research, and many, many more. She is a prolific uh, writer, and she's published many books on the topic of literacy and diversity. In fact, Kathy, I don't know where she finds time to sleep because there are only 24 hours in the day, but... Um, also, I want to draw your attention to the, the one of the most recent articles she published in The Reading Teacher, the latest uh, edition of The Reading Teacher, latest volume, which is open access. And I encourage every single person to get this article. It's called Stories Grounded in Decades of Research, What We Truly Know About the Teaching of Reading which leads us now into her presentation. Let's welcome a phenomenal literacy researcher, advocate, and a very dear friend of mine, Kathy Compton Lilly. Thank you, Kathy. I'm very humbled by that. Thank you. It's great to be with all of you. And I know that it's chilly up there and that you're in for some more weather tomorrow. So it's, um, you know, we joke all the time that we miss Wisconsin, but we don't wi miss the Wisconsin winters. So sending you lots of, um, of warm thoughts from South Carolina. So what I wanted to talk about today was thinking about, you know, one of the points that I tried to make in that reading teacher article is that, you know, when we teach reading, we need to teach, we need to think about the particular children we're teaching and that there's no one size fits all approaches despite recent calls that have um, tried to argue that there's um, you know, particular kinds of research we should pay attention to and that other kinds of research don't matter, or there's particular ways of teaching children and that other um, ways are not as important. So here I'm thinking of some of the media representations of reading and some of the critiques of things like three queuing systems and people advocating that you know kids need more phonics and teachers need to understand phonics better and you know, that's going to solve all the reading problems, it, you know, that children have in schools. And the, the, the premise of, of the article I wrote and the premise of what I want to talk about tonight is that there is no one way. Children are all different. We know that from our work with children in classrooms, those of us who have worked one on one with kids in intervention spaces, we know that they're different. And some of them, you know, learn to read by writing. And some of them learn to read when they find the right book. And some of them learn to read when they figure out how letters and sounds work together. So, you know, there's so many different ways kids come to be readers and writers. And I also think there's different kinds of research. And that's what I want to talk about today, is I want to kind of lay out this big field of what is reading research. And I want to um, problematize the idea that we figured out how kids learn to read or that we understand, you know, one magical formula that's going to work for all kids. Um, I want to problematize that quite a bit. And I want to think about the different types of research and how they're all valid in their own way. 
and they all provide us with the kind of information that is helpful to us as we work with children. Then I'm gonna end by talking about what kinds of research are most pertinent to our everyday lives as teachers, because I think there are many kinds of research and I think those different kinds of research speak to how we teach and we wanna be knowledgeable about all kinds of research, but at the same time, not all of those types of research are gonna help us in our one-on-one -on -one or our small group or our classroom interactions with children. Some of them help us figure out what to do a little bit more than others. So I'm going to talk about uh, making sense of research and I wanna get away from the either or, it should be phonics or whole language. We don't wanna do that. We wanna talk about instead of either or, it might be and. And there might be information that we learn from lots of different kinds of research. And that different types of research attend to different aspects of this phenomena, which is reading. We also want to um, know that expert teachers and learners can learn from different types of readers. So as teachers, we can read different kinds of research, we can hear about different kinds of research, we can go to the conference in Milwaukee, and we can hear different speakers drawing on different types of research, and we can learn from them. So, you know, keeping our minds open and not falling into this trap of I'm this or I'm that, that we're all learning from each other because reading is really complex and it takes more than one kind of research to understand um, reading in rich and powerful ways. We also have to think about who we're teaching because who we're teaching always matters the most. As I was saying a minute ago, different children learn to read in different ways. Some of them come in and they just figure out how words and letters work and they just fly, but they may have trouble comprehending. Other kids, you know, they seem to just struggle with the whole idea of how word letter, sounds map onto letters and how letters and words combine and how different letter, pa letter patterns um, create different sounds. So some children do need more phonics than others. And that's something that I think um, we have understood for a while. So back to the research. I'm gonna talk about five kinds of research that I believe are relative, are, are relevant to teaching reading. I'm gonna talk a little bit about randomized control trials and then social cultural research and then neuroscience and then observational research of children reading. And finally, I'm gonna end with what I'm calling postmodern studies of childhood. And I'm just gonna talk about each of them a little bit. And my goal is for us to walk away today with the sense that, oh, there's so much to reading. We need different ways of looking at it, different, different lenses to look through to be able to see different things in different aspects of reading. So let's talk about randomized control groups, uh, control trials for a minute. These are studies in which a, similar num a number of similar people are randomly assigned to two or more groups to test a specific drug. So it comes from medicine, right? Or some other kind of intervention. So in, in reading, we talk about interventions. But we have people who are randomly assigned but they're also similar enough. And sometimes the control groups are matched so that you have two kids reading at the same level in each group, another two kids reading in the same group, and another two kids reading at the same level. And so you match them so that the two groups are theoretically pretty similar to each other. Now these, um, these studies are very useful to identify large scale patterns. So something like the achievement gap. So if you look at the little chart there that's all blurry and you can barely read it, but what you see is a gap between low income and high income students in, ter in terms of their performance in school, right? So large scale studies help us to see large scale patterns such as ach achievement gaps and differences like that, which are really important. We need to understand when some kids are doing better on particular tasks than other tasks, other kids. So one of the most famous randomized control trials ever was project follow through. And this was one of the largest reading uh, research projects ever done. It began in 1968 and continued to 77. And what they did is they looked at um, different, the effectiveness of different um, instructional models um, and in different sites. So the models that emphasize basic skill succeeded better than models in helping other kids gain skills. So what they found is that when they took different um, instructional designs, so they took DISTAR, this was back in the day, they took open court, they took um, whole language types of activities, and they just had um, teachers teach those different ways, and then they did pre and post tests so they could see which kids made the best gains. Well, what they found was that um, um, basic skills, 
on things like being able to fill out the, the test sheets to be able to identify, you know, which letter goes with the picture, those kinds of things. It, on those lower basic skills, kids who got skills instruction did much better. But that, of course, makes sense, doesn't it? However, no model was more successful than the others on raising cognitive conceptual skills. So the skills that actually had to do with reading and comprehension, none of the models uh, made a big difference. There's also been a bunch of critiques about project follow through. And the big one was that there were design problems. So even though they found these gains for foundational skills, there were problems in how it was designed in the sense that there was variation um, among the, the implementation. So some schools they implemented with a great fidelity and they did it exactly the way they were supposed to do the program and others drifted and kind of changed things and didn't follow the, the, what they were supposed to do. So this is one of the problems. There was more variation within each model than there was from model to model. So what you saw were some discharge teachers who actually sounded more like whole language teachers and some whole language teachers that actually sounded more like skills-based teachers. So the ways they put the teachers into the categories had not um, proven true to the ways they actually taught. Um, in some instances, sites were included in the analysis that actually ceased to implement the models that they were assigned to do. So there were these, important, these very uh, serious problems with how it was done. So I guess the reason I'm showing you this is that when we think about quantitative research and comparing different models, there is very hard to, to do it in a way that we know that there's true, um, uh, that, that people are staying committed to the models that they're uh, espousing to do. Another thing that was important in project follow through is that even in, in, within each model, there were some really good teachers whose kids did very, very well. And within each model, there were some not so good teachers who kids didn't do well. So there's no more variation within the model in terms of the teacher. So there are analyses of this that say, what mattered wasn't the model. What mattered was the teacher. So what I'm trying to do here is to talk about, yes, these large scale um, uh, random control trials can help us see things, but they also are not as clean cut and as easy to, to um, compare as we might think. I now want to turn our attention to um, what works clearinghouse. This is much more recent, right? It's still posted. You can go up and look up different uh, instructional programs and find out how effective they are. The top most effective program is reading recovery. And why is it effective? Probably because it um, works one-on-one -on -one with kids and it pays attention to who the kids are and designs lessons in, that are responsive to particular kids and their backgrounds. So this is a control study in the sense that kids all over the United States are doing reading recovery and all of their scores are being sent to the headquarters and all of those scores are being processed and compared and tracked progress and comparing those kids to kids in a random sample who didn't get reading recovery, all of that is built into the program. So what we find is that um, even though you look here and it says, you know, tier two moderate effect or tier three promising effect, those don't sound that good, but these are actually among the highest scores for any program that is out there. There's other programs that are very common, but there's no studies that support them. So if you look at Orton Gillingham, for example, there are no studies based on those interventions that, that were considered high enough quality studies that showed that they were successful as an intervention. Now, this is really puzzling, isn't it? Because we have these um, quantitative types of studies, often control group based, um, that, that are basic. So basically, there's very popular programs that have very little research behind them. And, and that's what I want to um, think about here today. Another one that has very little research behind it is letters training. Okay. This, if the effect sizes for classrooms that their teachers had letters training and classrooms that teachers did not, the effect sizes were so small, they were not statistically significant. So what I'm saying is there are um, useful points to be made about randomized control studies. They report averages for groups of kids. You get to see gaps between different demographic groups. And they, they do give us some information that's important. But they can also be very
very misleading. So when you think about the test scores in your own classroom, you, you have to remember that in order for statistics to be, to be reliable and valid, you should have a sample size of at least 100 students. So if your administrator is comparing the kids' scores in your classroom to kids' scores in the classroom down the hall, unless you have 100 kids in both those classrooms, we're not really looking at statistically valid data. So I say this to kind of just put on the table some of these questions about um, randomized control trials. Randomized control type tr trials also only tend to factors that have been identified and integrated into the study design. So when you do a randomized control trial, there's particular variables you're gonna be looking at and tracking, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff you're not. And those things might be as important or even more important than the things you're tracking. But because when you design the study, you have to do the pre and the post and you have to look at the same variables, it's very hard to um, be able to track things that aren't pre-identified. And finally, who is sampled matters. I also showed you this little chart here. And if we think about randomized control trials, we're always looking at the medium or the mean. We're looking at the kids in the middle. So what does the group tend to do? But as you can see in the chart there, there's some outliers. There's some kids that are way up and there's some kids that are way down. And we have to teach those kids too, but they're not represented in the, in the norm, in the mean. So once again, I'm putting this out there to say, this is one kind of research. And it's the kind of research that tends to be um, recognized and get a lot of attention and to inform policy. However, there are lots of different considerations when thinking about these studies. And there's some weaknesses that we need to keep in our head as we think about what they do and what they don't do. So now I wanna to turn to another type of research and this is sociocultural research. And this is research that attends to social and cultural factors, all the things that happen in schools and all the things that happen in kids' lives. Social cultural factors include people's feelings and values and beliefs and behaviors and attitudes and interactions, all of the cultural stuff. They also include social class and religious beliefs and wealth distribution and language and business practices and social values values and preferences and social organization and attitudes toward work. They're all about how groups of people live and work together, what they believe, what they value. So social cultural research is really interested in the how, how things are happening and why things are happening rather than just what those outcomes are. So with social cultural research, we're attending to things like race and culture and language, socioeconomic status, responses and thoughts about ability and disability, and institutions, how they operate and why they operate in particular ways, including how and why schools operate. And one of the things that social cultural research has revealed to us is that every learner from every community brings what we call funds of knowledge to school. And this brings us to the work of Louise Small and the knowledge that kids and families bring, including their reading strategies and abilities, their, um, uh, what they already know about reading and writing when they enter school and their world, and the family literacy practices that they're drawing on as they come into schools. So these are the kinds of things we look at. And for this, I wanted to give you an example from my own research. So when Kathy introduced me, she mentioned that I was doing a longitudinal study that's been going on for 13 years now. And this was a study I started in Madison and I'm still working with one more child. One child entered the study when he was in preschool. So he's still working his way through high school. But I followed nine children from first grade all the way through high school. And they were all children, in immigrant families. And one of the things we did was to think about what are their funds of knowledge? What are the things that these kids know and can do? And what are the things that if your, um, your family's from another part of the world and speaks another language, what are the advantages? What, what's the stuff that you understand that kids born and raised in Wisconsin might not? So what we started to write about was transnational awareness, the understandings that they had about the world and their awareness that people in other parts of the world do things differently and that those differences are reasonable and valid. So when we first started the study, we weren't really thinking about transnational awareness. We were thinking about literacy and we were thinking about um, identities, who they, who they saw themselves as being, especially their literate identities. 
Um, but over time, they started creating these. Uh, we asked them to draw pictures and make maps and take photographs. And over time, we started noticing that they knew things about the world. And I wanted to share with you a little bit of data from that study. So this is Liz. And Liz was uh, it's from Alaska. So um, she drew a map of the world. And in her map of the world, she's got an area plane and the baggage going around on the conveyor belt. And, um, you know, so this is her map of the world. Um, she had gone to visit Korea. So that's why the airplane is there. But she, ta she talks about her map. And she says to us, she's six years old, she says, this is New York, and that's France. And this is the airplane. And this is lots of suitcases. That's orange in Korea. And right here's Texas. And here's Mexico. And here's French. And here's New York. And there's water. I thought this could be Mexico. But maybe this could be maybe Texas. And maybe this could be Korea. Or that can be Korea. And this can be Hawaii, and this can be water. So of course, her map is a little mixed up. Things aren't quite where we would put them in a conventional map. But she knows a lot about the world. She, she can name all these different countries. And she can talk about you know, the water and flying over the water when you go to Korea. You know, there are things that she knew and understood. This is James. And James's family is from China. And James drew a map of the world. And he draws his map, he's talking aloud. And he says, there's something kind of shaped like a triangle, but it looks like this. And he draws a triangular shape and he says, it's North America. And then he points saying, here's the land between North America and South America. And then South America. And this is. And he draws a circle and a triangle. And then here, this is Europe and America. And then he goes on to tell us there were plates and the plates were like moving around. And here's the Indian plate, which is around India and it includes the Indian Ocean. And here's part of North America and then the rest of the land connects to each other. And wait, remember that land we were talking about right here? It's China. And here's the land right there. And then right here's Russia. James was telling us about plate tectonics. And when we went to visit James home on his bedroom wall, there's a map of the world. And his parents had talked to him about how the how the continents had been together a long, 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 long time ago and how they've been shifting on the earth and that those plates had shifted. So here we had this you know, six-year-old child explaining plate tectonics and telling us about the world. So what, what we're saying here is that these kids had an awareness of the world, an awareness of um, not only the physical world, but they also talked about time differences. They talked about how the calendars are different in their home countries. They talked about... Um, you know, the temperatures being different um, for the children in Mexico, we talked about how hot it was. And of course, they're living in Wisconsin. So, um, you know, these were the important things that we're hearing about. So social cultural research. We're interested in the children's experiences, their social cultural meaning making, the things that make sense to them and how their understandings of the world and the funds of knowledge that they bring, how important those are. Now, just like with um, control random control trials, there's also um, issues with sociocultural research. It doesn't do everything well. It focuses only on small samples and local populations. I follow nine kids, all from the Madison area, for 13 years. I can say some things about kids from international families, but I can only say that in this sample, this is what I found, right? It, and, and it also involves large time commitments to collect all that data and to analyze that data. We were visiting the families three times a year, and I had several doctoral students who helped me on the project because it took a lot of work to go out and do the interviews, collect the data, visit the kids in their school, visit their communities, have them show us around, um, you know, have them draw all those pictures. There were lots and lots of data that we collected. But it can reveal complex relationships and help us think about endless considerations. But the more complex it gets and the things that the kids bring into it, things like transnational awareness, which we weren't even thinking we were looking for until we started to see it. We see these complexities, but it makes it really hard to distill the large data sets. I literally have, oh, probably uh, four file cabinets full of files that we've collected through this process. So there's these huge amounts of data, but even those large data those large data sets don't capture everything that we could consider 
when we think about these children as text users and as readers and writers. So social, finally, social and cultural claims are elusive and they're difficult to nail down. So we can talk about transnational awareness, but it looked different with James than it looked with Liz. And it looked different with the different kids in the sample. And some of the kids were more or less aware of their world. So, you know, all of these claims that we're making are always very situated within particular spaces. We can't say things about large groups of children based on um, sociocultural qualitative research. So now, neuroscience. I know this is so not reading very hard to figure out where in the brain reading happened and specifically where in the brain kids who are dyslexic might have differences in their um, in their cognitive um, functioning and in how their brain worked. So neurosciences scientists for a long time were trying to figure out where in the brain reading happens but that didn't work because what they found was that reading networks map across the brain. And there's different brain regions that work together. And there's different brain regions that are activated depending on the kind of reading challenge or the kind of reading tasks that people are involved in. So neuroscientists have associated, for example, phonological analysis and decoding with multiple regions of the brain that work together. So it's not one part of the brain that's doing it. It's kind of, if you're trying to figure out a particular word, there's different parts of the brain that are activated depending on what the word is, what the letters are, what the letter patterns are, what the meaning of that word is, how familiar you are with the word. All of these things are happening and different parts of your brain are being activated. So this is from our article that came out in The Reading Teacher. Um, and we had uh, two people who are very knowledgeable about the brain who were co-authors on that paper, Dr. Lucy Spence and Dr. Scott Dexter. Decker, um, both of them, um, Scott Decker in particular, is a, a neuroscientist and he with an interest in reading. And he helped us to figure out how complicated it was and that these reading processes, phonetics, orthographic, semantics, syntax, are distributed across the brain. Now, looking at this list, it looks a lot like three cues, doesn't it? Okay, so if we put phonetics and orthographics together, we would have the visual system or the graphophonic system. And then, of course, semantics and syntax are um, meaning and structure. So when we think about how reading is distributed across the brain, what we're actually finding is that our three queuing systems model maps brilliantly onto what people are finding in neuroscience research. So this is an infographic that we created as part of our project, and it tries to show us some of the different parts of the brain. So it's color coded, so you can see some of the color coding that's happening, but also labeled. And we can see again how the, um, the three queuing systems and the executive functioning that operates to coordinate those systems um, is actually reinforced by brain research. Um, and also note that this particular infographic is only capturing some of the processes. It's kind of just a surface glance of some of the things that are happening because of course it's much more complicated than we could fit onto one piece of paper. So what are the neuro, the limitations of neuroscience? You know, I'm, I'm saying this and I'm saying, oh, it's exciting because it seems to map on to what we've been arguing for a long time in reading. Um, but neuroscience is, is limited in the sense that it describes what's happening internally, but it doesn't tell us how to teach, right? It tells us that things are networked, which suggests that we need to teach in a way that helps kids to network. But other than that, it doesn't give us specific teaching strategies. It doesn't tell us particular activities that are more or less important than others. So it's not directly translatable to practice, at least not yet. And um, most neuroscientists who are honest with, with the educational community will say that we're only at the beginning of starting to understand what happens in the brain. So now I want to turn to that observational research. And this is where those three queuing systems come from. They come from observing kids read and watching what they do when they came, come to a point of difficulty in text. So for decades, reading scholars and educators have used observation. Mari Clay did this. Ken Goodman did this. Um, many, many uh, reading scholars who do who watch kids read um, use those observations. 
they, to, to understand what readers do and how they approach reading challenges. Now, we have to remember that observation is really an important scientific tool. It's used by scientists in all fields. If you're a biologist, you're out there watching animals in their natural habitat. If you're an astronomer, you're watching the stars. If you're studying zoology, if you're studying anatomy, if you're studying geography, all of these people are doing observations to figure out what's going, going on in the world. Um, I think that last one's supposed to be geography. Ge um, oh, what's the word? Um, geology. Geology. <clears throat> like stones, like when you're looking at rocks, right? So all observation is really important. And as we have the storm coming at us tomorrow, we'll be thinking about our, our weather specialists and how they're using observations of um, different uh, things that they're measuring around the wind and the uh, movement of the, stone, the storms as they come across the United States. Hmm. Okay. So observation is not synonymous with anecdotal accounts. When we talk about scientific observation, we're not talking about telling stories. We're not talking about, oh, here's what happened to me with a child today when we were reading. Those are observations and they can be important for our practice, but scientific observation involves systemic, targeted and systemic, strategically planned observations that are subject to thoughtful and intentional analyses. So we're not just saying, here's what happened. We're really looking at things closely. We're transcribing what is said. We're videotaping and analyzing what actually happened. We're watching to see how kids respond. And we're watching to see how kids respond to the prompts that we're giving them while they're reading over time. We're saying, oh, here's what happened today. I prompted him, did this. Here's what happened the next day. I did this. Here's what happened the next day, right? And, and here's where things change. Here's where we start to see acceleration in this kid's reading process. So really thinking about observations as a scientific tool. And observations have been around for a long, long time. Informal reading inventories first appeared in the 1940s. They're the predecessors to um, uh, miscue analysis and to running records. Gray in 1916 described informal measures designed to track oral and silent reading rates, as well as student abilities to decode words and comprehend. So we've been designing, creating, and observing reader, creating uh, ways of observing, right? Uh, methods for observation and then observing readers for over a hundred years and um, going to be a useful tool. So again, this is where miscue analysis and running records come from. And we can use those observations to figure out what kinds of support, how to help kids um, and how to help particular kids because we know that different kids do different things on the Some of them do, and some of them be system is a real tool for understanding what kids are doing as readers. Um, we can only focus on one reader at a time, um, and sometimes that can be difficult. And that only patterns across observational studies are generalizable. So if I do one study with one kid and I see particular patterns for their reading and writing, that is not all that useful except for teaching that child, but I can't generalize it to other children. What we need are many, many, many different accounts of different readers. And I think, you know, over time, we, we, we've done a very good job of, of accumulating um, different uh, representations of different kids reading. So we do know a lot about um, patterns with kids and in instruction and how observations can help us teach kids. So the last one I wanna talk about, and this one's really kind of an odd one. This, this is a, a newer way of thinking about kids and reading and kids and literacy and kids and schooling in general, We, especially young children. So um, there's a lot of work being done in childhood right now that is called Postmodern Studies of Childhood. And this one may seem really odd to you, but I think especially because I do this longitudinal research, it's really powerful to me because sometimes as I follow kids over time, particular things happen and the trajectory changes. 
things just push kids in one direction or another direction. Sometimes it's good things that happen. Sometimes it's not so good things that happen. Sometimes it's lots of different little things that kind of add up. Sometimes it's random things that seem totally unconnected, but somehow come together as the child moves forward. Sometimes it's things that they pick up on and start to become really important to them. And all of a sudden they're not interested in it anymore. And they go on to something else. So it's these, all these idiosyncratic things that happen in people's lives and in children's lives. And I think that sometimes we don't pay enough attention to these un the unpredictability of trajectories. In education, in research, especially in causal research, where we're trying to figure out, you know, what do we do with young children so they'll have better long-term outcomes? We're always thinking about how we can create educational experiences early on that will have um, big, uh, important outcomes later, positive outcomes later. But sometimes, uh, trajectories are unpredictable and there's these kind of random things that happen and kids make sense of their experiences and their interests and their memories and frustrations and hopes over time in interesting ways. So they draw on all of these experiences and they draw on these feelings as well as the stories that they hear and the stories that they read and the responses they get from other people. So what I'm trying to describe is kind of what this image here is, is this kind of collage of all these different experiences that children have and how they draw on those experiences to become who they are. And we all do this and we're all doing this all the time. But what we get away from is this idea that things are predictable and under our control. And this way of thinking about readers it is much more complicated. So I'm gonna to read to you a little bit of some of the theoretical kind of talk around this. I'm not sure, um, you know, it, I'm not sure it made sense to me the first time I heard it, but I just wanna give you a sense of the kinds of things we think about in these postmodern studies of childhood. We think about past, present and, thre and future threading through one another in a non-linear unfolding of space-time matters. So we've got space and time and matter, the things, so you've got things and time and the spaces we're in and all of those things kind of coming together alongside the past, present, and future. There's a topology that defines, defies any suggestion of a smooth, continuous manifold. There's not one, one smooth track. There's not a trajectory that people um, take forward. It's more messy. It's kind of all over the place. So being and becoming a reader can be viewed as a series of activities, iteratively, differentiatingly, entangling within and across fields of space, time, and matter. And that both, de they deny linear notions of development and they can only be traced and named retroactively. So development, becoming, becoming a reader is not linear. That there's different books, there's different texts, there's different in interactions, there's different um, friends that you read with at different points in time, there's different teachers you had that inspired you in different ways. And then it's only when we look back where we can say, oh, here's how I learned to read. When actually it's much messier than that. And, and, and when you're in the moment, it's very hard to explain what's actually happening. So this is a, a, one of my other longitudinal studies where I followed a child from first grade to grade 11. And these are some of the different pathways that I saw in his being and becoming a writer. So I was focusing on his writing in this particular example and just showing how there's all these different experiences and how some of them became relevant as he talked about himself as a writer. But it's not a clear linear account. The arrows are kind of going all over the place, forward, backward, across, um, all of those sorts of things. So here, when we think about this kind of messy view and this idea that, you know, we don't have as much control over kids learning and becoming as we think we might, um, the critiques would be things like, this seems irrelevant, right? It's irrelevant to the ways we think about school and the ways we think about learning and the ways we measure learning. So that would be one argument. Another is it highlights the complex and idiosyncratic nature of life. You know, it, it's so complex that how can we use it to become better teachers and, and, and to work with children. It also denies the possibility of prediction and correlation, and thus the idea that we can tr control learning to read. So although I think these studies have their limits in terms of their applicability to classrooms, I think they also remind us something about human nature. And they remind us something about kids and becoming and what it means to be a reader and a writer. So what kind of research is best? I would say it depends. 
If you want to track the learning of large groups of children, randomized control trials. If you want to understand the experiences of children from particular communities, social cultural research. If you want to understand how the brain processes text, neurological research. And if you want to know how to help a particular child, close observations of that reader. And if you want to understand the long-term becoming of a child without imposing expectations and prediction, postmodern studies of childhood. So I think all of these kinds of research, when I think about what I know and understand about reading, I draw on all of these. There are things that are useful from every single one of these different ways of, 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 um, of looking. Research is, is basically a way of looking at a phenomenon. So I think all of these inform how we can think about reading. Um, they all have their limits and they all have their affordances. So what I wanna end with though, is this, I, oh, I wanna go back to one thing here. Um, I do wanna say that if you're a classroom teacher and if you wanna know how to help a particular child, then observation is going to be really, really important. That close observation, especially of those children in your class, maybe the three or four kids who are really struggling with reading. A lot of our kids, you know, they're going to figure out reading, they're gonna find their favorite books, they're gonna thrive, they're going to do well, they're gonna make great progress. Um, but those kids who are struggling, those are the ones you have to really spend a lot of time watching and paying attention to. Um, so those, those observations are key there. And then what I wanna leave you with is the thesis from the um, article that we had in The Reading Teacher, which is how you teach reading must be determined by who you are teaching. Anything else is flawed. And I'm gonna draw on, on Elizabeth Moji here saying, reading is a complex multi-dimensional multi cognitive process situated in and mediated by social and cultural practices. And teaching depends on knowing what students know and what they can do and then determining what they need. So although there's all kinds of research, we need to read them all. We need to have a huge toolkit of tools that we can rely on. We need to be as expert in reading as we can become. We still need to put this child at the center when we figure out what we're going to do with that child. And that observational research is key to that. So thank you so much for spending time with me this evening. I hope this was interesting. We've got plenty of time for questions and conversation. And um, I really look forward to having a conversation with all of you. Oh, 